women who serve here. We thank you so much for each one. We ask you today to please heal Carol, be with Rochelle and her unborn child. And we ask you to please be with each of those women in the prison and with Janet as she goes in there today. Now, I ask you to please listen for just a moment to the unspoken requests as we take a moment of silence. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing us today. Please give us faith, help our unbelief. I know that you hear us, I know that you can do anything, and that you promised, if we ask in Jesus' name, according to your will, that you will do what we ask. So we ask these things in your name, according to your will. But above all, we ask that you please take us all to heaven together with you in the end. And thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. I realized something really important. When I was up here before, I was supposed to introduce Miss Carolyn, <laughs> and I forgot. I would like to introduce you to Carolyn Crawford. Um, she is, has become a very dear friend. It's funny how honestly little I know her and how good a friend <laughs> I feel she is. And I have watched her in so many circumstances be that way to so many people. If she has met you, she knows you and already loves you. <laughs> and she remembers you. That's the incredible thing. And um, I have just enjoyed, and I did not get a bio on her. I should have. And maybe she'll tell us a little bit. I don't know if she wants to do that. But she is a very educated, very smart woman who... Um, has done a lot of incredible things and we just appreciate so much her being here and she is going to bless us with a special music and then um, speak to us. Good morning, Good morning. church family. Into temptation. 
man, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the We received blessings this morning. We had no idea that we would be needing each other and the Lord had everything in her bag is what I'm told. <laughs> I'm not at all interested in you remembering me as uh, one who has a PhD or anything else. I want to be remembered as a child of God and your sister. So when I come to Cowboy Camp Meeting, I just look forward to it. It's just such a wonderful gathering. You know, it's great to come together as we are here today, to receive the blessings and just share with one another. And at the beginning of every day, to seek a sense of direction before we start our work or activities. And always remembering to refresh God's promises. Let me share what the spirit of prophecy indicates. We know not the results of a day, an hour, or a moment may determine. And never should we begin the day without committing our ways to our Heavenly Father. For after all, when we are unconsciously in danger of exerting a wrong influence, the angels will be by our side, prompting us to a better course, choosing our words. Now I need to ask you, do we need help in choosing our words? You know, our Sabbath school lesson indicated that our words reveal what's really in our heart. Hmm? You know, I just had a person to say to me, I I'm surprised that you're just driving a Nissan. Um, I thought you would have been in a... Uh, did she choose her words? A young man told me this week, he says, you know, I have a new girlfriend. And someone came up to me and said, are you having sex? I, oh, why would that come out of somebody's mouth? You know, we need to choose our words wisely. You know, Jesus did not suppress one word of truth, but he uttered it always in love. He exercised the greatest amount of tact. And I think that's what's missing. We don't have tact. We need to be thoughtful. We should have kind attention. And in his interaction with people, he was always kind. He was never rude. Is there anyone uh, present today that has not been rude? Raise your hand. <laughs> Jesus never needless spoke a severe word, never gave needless pain to a sensitive soul. He did not censor human weakness. So why do we? He spoke the truth always in love. Also, the angels will be influencing us if we will allow it, our actions. Thus, our influence may be silent, unconscious, 
but mighty power in drawing others to Christ and the heavenly world. I have a question for you. Would you agree that we do not have the wisdom to plan our own lives? I want to stop and reflect on the fact that the women met at some person's, a member's home last night. And I thought that was really wonderful just to get together and not really have to be worried about business or the laundry or whatever is going on. I think most of you are aware of that. But I want to share with you that our world church, our world church, is leading out in the recognition of women's awareness. Why do we stop and recognize women? Well, perhaps because the 2005 world population data indicate that women make up 60% of the world population. Then it should not surprise you, after learning of that makeup of the world's population, that women make up the majority of Seventh-day Adventist membership worldwide. <laughs> In addition, it shouldn't surprise you that I viewed the directory for general conference and 55% of their employees are women. But perhaps we should stop here. And I want to view these numbers with heavenly eyesight and wisdom. What do these numbers reflect as it relates to how we are enhancing our gifts and our talents that God has given to you and me? How are these numbers relating to our salvation as well as those we come in contact with every day? Then may I ask you if we could just get practical this morning. What does God expect from these numbers? What does God expect from his children, women, men? He does not merely give us a set of expectations. He actually shows us how to live, how to obtain the expectation. If you would, turn with me to 1 Timothy, the first chapter in the 16th verse. I'll give you a moment to get there. And I will be quoting from the King James Version and Living Bible People's Translation. How be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth long suffering for a pattern for what? And you can all talk at once. For what? For a pattern. To them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. What does God expect of me and you? We know that as Christian men and women, God wants us to use our gifts and our talents in service. But what we don't know, or perhaps we really don't acknowledge is, that God should be the center of our lives before we use our gifts and talents. Amen? Amen. And if he's not, guess what? Nothing else matters, Teresa. Nothing else matters. I wonder, Stephen, where have we gone wrong? Jesus was a teacher. Such an educator as the world never saw or heard of. He spoke as one having authority. Turn to Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. And I think we could all quote this for memory. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy, 
and my burden is light. The only begotten Son of the infinite God has by his words, his practical examples, left us a plain pattern. A plain what? A plain pattern which we are to copy with God's hand on us. By his words, he has educated us to obey God. And by his practice, he has showed us how we can obey. This is the very work he wants every man and woman to do. Yes, but to obey intelligently. Mm. Intelligently. God desires us to exercise our reasoning power and the study of the Bible will strengthen and elevate the mind as no other study can. Yes, by precept and example, teach others what they must do in order to be obedient children of God. Don't force feed them. Don't peel back their skull and try to pour information in. Did you hear that? I was at a practice last night. We were getting ready to do a, a Christmas concert at the Mormon church this evening at 7 o'clock. One of the tenors is sick. If you can hear my voice, I think mine may be coming on from being around them. And he couldn't sing. So he had to go to the doctor, and he got a prescription. That prescription was good for what the doctor prescribed. But could he take the whole prescription at one time? Would it be good? So it is with the word of God. Don't overdose people. Give it to them at the right time. Give them what they need at that moment. Let's learn to be good listeners and then share with people. Not only did Christ give explicit rules for showing how we may become obedient children, sons and daughters, but he showed us in his own life and his character just how to do those things which are right and pleasing and acceptable with God. So there's really actually no excuse why we should not do those things which are pleasing in his sight. The great teacher came to our dark world to stand at the head of humanity. And I believe that darkness has almost reached its limits. Just listening at the news every day and observing what is going on. Yes, he came to remove the dark shadow by revealing to the world the infinite love of God that Jesus came to live among men and women. You see, showing that he would elevate and sanctify humanity by his holy obedience to all of God's requirements. Did you hear that word, all? all of his requirements, not those that are convenient for us, showing that it is possible to obey all of the, of the commandments. He has demonstrated that a lifelong obedience is possible. Thus, he has chosen representatives. And who might that be? You and I. Yes, you and I. We are to be representatives to the world as the Father gave his Son. We are not our own to act as we choose, but, you know, it's just my personality. Why I, you know, sometimes come across in a very harsh way. Sorry. Time out. We are not our own to act as we choose. We are called to be representatives of Christ. We are bought with a price as the chosen sons and daughters of God, we should be obedient, acting in accordance with the pr principles of his characters as revealed through his son. To exemplify in our life 
the life of Jesus Christ. In him was found the perfect ideal. To reveal this ideal as the only true standard for attainment. To show what every human being might become through the indwelling of humanity by divinity that all who receive him would become. You see, it is God's purpose to manifest through you and I the principles of his kingdom. And sometimes I think we get the principles mixed up with our preferences. Sorry. We are to reveal his principles, not our likes and our dislikes, that in the life and character they may reveal what God would have them to know. He desires to separate you and me from the customs, habits, and practices of the world. Oops. Huh? By beholding the goodness, the mercy, the justice, and the love of God revealed in his church. That the world is to have a representation of his character. For this, Christ came to this world. He came to show men and women how to be trained, how on earth they are to practice the principles and live the life of heaven. It said they were to be trained, not forced. They are not to be treated like we're in the armed services where we all have to do this at this time and this is the way you have to do this. We are to give each person the opportunity to grow as Christ has given each one of us to grow. So what does God expect of you and me? Turn quickly to Mark 12, 30 and 31. And I know that most of us know this one. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all the soul and with all the mind and with all the strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Do you believe that? Well, do you think do you think we know how to love? If we actually knew how to love, we could disagree with one another and not put the church in just shambles. We need to learn to disagree in love. You see, God desires that we should love him first. See, don't try to love me until you love him. Because we can't do it in and of ourselves. Do you believe that? That we put him first in our lives. That's what he desires. That we make him the center in the joy of our life. Some may falsely believe this morning that, that you have already arrived. Mm, think again. And if God is not first in your life, it's not too late to make him first. Then he will provide clear directions. He has that GPS for what he wants to accomplish. What God expects of you and me. Let's be serious about that. Just think. If we lose heaven, we lose everything. If we gain heaven, we gain everything. Let's not leave this assembly this morning without lifting our eyes to the Savior and saying, let's 
lift Jesus as the center of our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Our closing song will be 54, Great is, our, great is Thy Faithfulness. would like to invite y'all to stay for potluck. We have some amazing men at this church as well as women, but they have shopped and they have prepared for the food for today. There's plenty of food, so we invite all of you to stay and enjoy to see what the men have provided for us. Shirley's going to give our uh, prayer today. Let's bow our heads. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you for your faithfulness to us, and we thank you for this church, uh, and for all the many people who have put it together to make it a strong church, and we ask that, we'll, that you will bless us, bless our meal today. We thank you for the men who have cooked it, and we ask that you'll bless our food and our fellowship today. In our precious name, amen. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> We'd just like to welcome everybody here this morning on a nice Sabbath morning. Our first song that we're going to sing is um, number 131, and I think the words will also be on the screen. Oh, it's not 131. 133. 133, I'm sorry. Faith of Our Fathers. our next song. Five thirty-eight. Now I belong to Jesus.
556. Jesus is all the world to me. There are four announcements this morning that we want to especially draw your attention to. The first one is just for the women. Tonight, put on your pajamas and come to Teresa's house. We're going to have a pajama party and you will have a good time, so don't forget to come about seven 
and um, come join every one of us there. The second announcement is a very important one. If you ordered fruit, make sure that you pick it up uh, tomorrow between 9 and 4 because they are, will be waiting for you to come to get your fruit at that time. The third program that you will want to attend this week is the Christmas program for the elementary school. And even if you don't have a child or a grandchild, come anyway, because it's such a wonderful program to enjoy and to put the Christmas spirit into your heart. The fourth announcement that is very important for each one of you to share, not only with your family, but with your friends, is our special Christmas service next Sabbath. Come at nine for breakfast, and then bring all of your company that has come for the holidays with you, and your neighbors, um, and they will enjoy not only the breakfast, but they will enjoy the very special Christmas service that will follow that. And you will not want to miss that, I know. If you have been saving these wonderful containers, and I hope many of you have, putting your extra change. Um, this one is pretty full of quarters and dimes and nickels and pennies. And this is what you have been filling up as the months have gone by. We encourage you to bring them in now before the end of the year. And Nora will have the lovely job of counting all of this, but I don't think she really minds all that much. I think, I'm not sure, but I think she takes it somewhere, a machine counts it, so she doesn't have to go penny by penny, nickel by nickel. But don't, do remember to bring in your containers of coins that you have been saving. One of the very special privileges that we have as a church family is to welcome new members. And so I would like to invite Stephen Martin to come up and join me. Stephen has been attending church here, but his membership has finally come through and he is, will now be an official member of our church family. Stephen is a senior at Ozark Academy, and so that means he cannot always be here with us every single Sabbath because there are certain responsibilities that he has in connection with the Academy. But we are so happy to have him as a part of our church family. He is a grandson to Dr. and Mrs. Blount, who many of you know. And I hope you will join me in welcoming Stephen this morning. And if you have not if you have not met Stephen, introduce him yourself to him during the potluck today. I understand there's one lady here who may want to introduce herself to you. She tells me she was your kindergarten teacher when you were very young. Oh. And that is Karen Fritz back oh, there. Okay. Oh, yes, and see, I told you he would remember you. She said, oh, he won't remember me, yeah. but he does. So be sure to give Stephen a good welcome today. Thank you. All right, kids, it's time for the children's story. You can collect your lamb's offering and bring it up to our church.
All right, it's good to see all of you guys here today at church. <laughs> all right. How many of you guys like to get surprises? Okay. How many of you guys like to get surprises at Christmas? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, today the story about one of my biggest surprises at Christmas ever. But first, I, I want to tell you guys something. It's a cold, hard truth that when you get older and you look back at all your Christmases, they're going to kind of blur together. You're not going to really remember each Christmas. You might um, remember that you had happy times because you were with your family. And you might remember that you did some special traditions. But all in all, your Christmases are going to blur together unless you're really lucky like me and my brother, Doug the Pug. And we have one Christmas that really stands out. Um, do you guys remember a couple of weeks ago, one of my brothers showed you some pictures and told you a story about Doug the Pug who liked to ride the horse? Nubbin, and, he, and what would happen to him? He would like to show off, and then what would happen? He'd fall off. He'd fall in the creek, because Nubbin would go faster through the creek, and he'd fall off every time. This is a story about my brother, Doug the Pug, okay? And we grew up out in the country, okay? This is a picture of our barn, okay? We had a house and a pasture, and we had a barn. Now this barn was really, really fun. All of my brothers have great memories of this barn. It's so special in our minds when we look back that just this year, when my mom made me a, a, a birthday card, she drew me, a, she drew me a birthday card. This is my birthday card that my mama gave me this year. And this is our house, and this is our barn. When I was a little girl, she liked to draw me pictures of bunnies and um, you can see there's a little cat right there. But she drew me the picture. And a couple of years ago, my brother Doug the Pug, because the barn is so special to him, he had a painting. He had a painting of the barn. And that's our barn. This is me, and this is Doug the Pug, okay? So before I tell you the story, I got to explain the barn a little bit to you, okay? You can see the ladder right here, and it went up to a hayloft. And we had square, square bales of hay up there. And we would climb up there, and we'd move those bales of hay. We would make forts and tunnels. We'd make beds, because sometimes we would even sleep up there in the hayloft. This door right here, yeah. that went to um, just like a tackle room. That's where all the saddles and bridles were. And there was always a bag of feed. And you know what would live in the bag of, bag of feed sometimes? A little mouse. <laughs> And that was just creepy when you'd reach down there and get a, get a bowl full of feed for the horse and there'd be a little mouse down there. The barn had um, three stalls, basically. There were two stalls over here and a stall over here for the horses. We had Buddy, Lady, and this is the horse that Doug the Pug would fall off. That's Nubbin. That's our little horse. And in the back of the barn, can you see right here? Oh, this... This would be a uh, big red. That's a story for later. And this would be our little goat. But back here was the chicken pen, okay? And the chicken pen had its own special little room. It was a chicken coop. And the chickens had a little door. They would go in and uh, roost or lay their eggs. Um, sometimes we had chickens and sometimes we didn't. And my story today is about a time that we did not have chickens, okay? So this is the story, okay? It was Christmas break. Okay, it had snowed. Me and Doug the Pug were all by ourselves at home while Mom and Daddy were at work. And we played all the time. We would play hide and seek in the house. We would bundle up and go outside in the yard. We would go down to the barn. We would play in the hayloft. There were shoots that you could throw hay down. We would crawl through those. We played and played. We would get cold. We'd come in, sit by the fire, maybe watch a cartoon, and we'd go back outside and play. We were having a great time those three or four days before Christmas. So it was Christmas Eve, the night before Christmas. And we knew that we had presents under the tree because we shook them. Do you guys ever shake your presents? 
You guys ever shake your presents and try to, try to figure out what's in them? We knew we had five presents or six presents under the tree. And we knew, yeah, yeah. We knew the next morning we'd wake up and we'd get to open those presents. And we were so excited. So we went to bed. And I don't really remember the next morning. I'm sure my daddy got up and made a fire in the fireplace. And I'm sure my mama got up and started some, some, some breakfast. And I guess they called us at the same time, me and Doug the Pug, to come out into the living room. And there we had the biggest surprise. One of the biggest surprises of our life. Under the tree were two new bikes. We did not have bikes. These were the first bikes we ever had. Mine was a prairie flower. It was pink and red and white, and it had a basket on it. And Doug the Pugs was a huffy. It was brown and orange, and it had big tires. And we were so excited. We said, where did these come from? And my dad said, well, we've been hiding them. And we said, no, we have been all over this place. We've been all over the house. We've been all over the barn. And Mama said, yeah, we've been hiding them for, from you this week. And we just couldn't believe it. And we said, where? Where were you hiding them? And my daddy said, in the chicken coop. And true enough, we had not been in the chicken coop. Because why would we want to go in there? It was kind of dark and kind of dirty. And we did not, that was the one place that we didn't check. And all the time, while we were playing in this barn, there were two bikes hiding from us. And we didn't know. I like to think about my mom and dad so excited to give us those presents our first bikes and I like to think about my dad going down and picking those bikes up and bringing them down through the pasture to give to us and it reminds me of a verse in the Bible it says even you though you are bad know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to you do you guys know that Jesus loves you very much we sang that song Jack right Jesus loves me this I know Jesus loves us so much and I have a surprise for you this morning, but before I give you the surprise, I wanted to read one thing for the adults because it just kind of has struck me this week. <coughs> Hold on just a minute. <coughs> Can't find it. I guess some big worldly issues has kind of snuck into our family as my boys have gotten older. And I found this and I really liked it. The heart of the human father yearns over his son. He looks into the face of his little child and trembles at the thought. He longs to shield his dear one from Satan's power, to hold him back from temptation and conflict. To meet a bitterer conflict and a more fearful risk, God gave his only begotten son that the path of life might, may be, might be made sure for our little ones. All right, that's embarrassing, but that's okay. I tease Jim all the time when he cries. But um, Jesus loves us a lot. And he wants to give us good things. So your church this morning has given you guys a surprise. So we're going to pass those surprises out. But I want you guys to not open your surprise until you go home. Can you promise me that? Not open your surprise until you go home. It's time for our tithes and offerings. If I could have my helpers come up, please.
just want to remind everybody, while this is certainly a time to be joyous and happy and giving, giving is, should weigh heavy on our hearts. There are many people in need this time of year also. And if you bow your heads, please. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, once again we humbly come to you with our heads bowed and our hearts heavy. We are certainly happy for this time of year to be able to have our family and loved ones close to us. But Lord, help us to always remember that there are those that are not quite so fortunate and that are in need this year, this time of year, either monetarily wise or food wise or emotionally drained and just need to know and feel your loving arms around them. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to help our friends and our family and our community. We ask this in your loving name that you bless our offerings and tithes and put them to the use where you feel that they need to be the most. Amen. Women's Weekend, and um, we're just so glad to, um, you know, take a weekend to kind of recognize. We laughed this morning, Brian and I were talking that Women's Weekend should actually probably be where the women absolutely do nothing. The men, you know, from the cooking and cleaning to every single, you know, the piano, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, every single detail, um, but that's probably a little harder to pull off. Um, but, uh, you know, we just really have had fun over the years to kind of taking this weekend and, and recognizing women. And I got to thinking about this. This was um, actually supposed to be a special feature this morning. And the more I, but we have a video that we're going to show. It's a short little video um, that's called The Invisible Woman that we're going to show. And as I was kind of just working on this, I thought it just goes with this. So, and I, and I wanted a lot of the women that I'm going to talk about were in divisions or doing different things. And so, um, I just thought I would just do it real quick now. It won't be long. Um, you know, there's a lot of women to recognize, a lot of women that do things that nobody notices, a lot of, a lot of things going on in this church and other churches. Um, but I'm going to mention a few. And, um, you know, just uh, I'm going to start with Joyce Parrish, her face. <laughs> but real quick, just want to recognize, you know, Joyce has kept a lot of foster kids over the years. We've been privileged in this church to get to know a lot of them. And I, that is a very special ministry where a lot of things happen. And I, I think it is a testimony to what she has done with these foster children because even last week, Josh and Jessica were here visiting our church. You know, they have a relationship with her and they come and she, you know, is able to witness to them in a lot of ways. Uh, Marty's not here today, but I, you know, recognize the back porch ministry. Marty's in a lot of pain, a lot of pain, physical pain right now. Hopefully that improves soon. But she keeps us moving, our little back porch committee. Sometimes we make fun of her and we tell her she's a little bit 
too uptight. <laughs> but uh, she, I'm telling you, she keeps us moving, you know, and that's what it takes to, to accomplish the things that have, you know, we've had some wonderful events and more to come. And the next thing is the kids' bread bake, and we're ex getting excited about working on that. Um, another one is Kelly Hostetter. It's kind of funny because Andrea just talked to me about uh, all the costumes and everything just a minute ago. That's funny, but that's what I'm going to mention. Um, Kelly called me this week. She said, do you have any country instruments? Because she's helping to put together the uh, props and costumes and things for the OAS Christmas program. And she's done that over the years <laughs> multiple times for the, the grade school, the academy, for their big programs. You know, has kind of taken that on and, and done a lot with it. And it just, you know, I thought, people don't really see that. You know, the kids come out in their costumes and they look great and they're playing whatever little bucket they were supposed to play and nobody will realize you know we'll think about the behind the scenes to get that kind of thing done um, you know we've mentioned Janet before you know Janet has an incredible ministry with prison ministry you know most of us know that you know some of us in our lady study group we are privileged to hear probably more details you know than what you'll get in church and to really see what a ministry that is you know, she's a mentor, encourager, counselor, and mother to a lot of these girls in jail. And then she's also a wonderful daughter to her, her dad. And, um, you know, I was thinking of Sherry Cash. You know, it's hard to be married to a preacher. Roberta can tell you that. <laughs> I'm sure sometimes she feels like a single mom so that Tony can be free, you know, to, to be the pastor that he is for us and for Siloam. Um, Carol Shane, I knew that she was out of town today, but, you know, watching her minister to her parents, um, you know, as they have aged has just, it's been a real blessing, I think, to a lot of us, you know, in the kind of daughter and uh, that she has been. Gina Webb is one. She's not here, but, um, you know, a lot of you probably don't even know who Gina is. She's not here a lot. She works a lot. She's a, a, a neonatal, I see, I don't know what she is, neonatal nurse practitioner, yeah. <laughs> um, she works in Tulsa, so I mean, she's gone a lot. But, you know, of course her her occupation is great. That's important. All the babies, all of that's great, wonderful. But it's, it's the other things that she does. You know, she is the a volunteer nurse for the academy. Um, you know, a sponsor doing some of those things. And, you know, sometimes if you, if you really want to know what she does kind of behind the scenes, just talk to Laura. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times when Laura was the dean of girls being on the phone calling Gina at all hours of the night because of something, you know, going on in the girls' dorm. Um, you know, I think of Nora. Um, I saw her early. She, she's over there. <laughs> and all the, you know, volunteer hours spent on the finances of this church. And I should have brought a, a sheet with me. You know, you can go back years and still find out what we've spent on things. What, you know, if you come to a business meeting, what you see, you know, and, and it, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time. And we appreciate that. Uh, you know, I was thinking of Noreen and Ann, uh, all the hours they spent on the food boxes, Deliver, you know, putting them together, first organizing the food, then putting them together, then delivering. I mean, it was a lot of hours that those two put in, you know, just in that one area. Um, you know, I think of, uh, I think of Nylita. When we're at, she's just looking at me. Um, you know, at study group, a lot of times we'll have food or something left over. We'll kind of make, and she is so willing to take it and drop it off somewhere or to minister. And one of the people that she always thinks of, she, she likes to look out for Shirley. <laughs> for Shirley Langford, that's one, you know. And then in speaking about Shirley, you look at the ministry that Shirley has had. You know, she raised her family, then she raised three grandkids, and now she's kind of working on some great-grandkids. Um, you know, and that is a powerful ministry that she has. Um, I uh, got a uh, text yesterday from Kim <laughs> Tidwell, and uh, it was a video. And I don't know all the ins and outs. Boy, I'm going to be DeRay in a minute. Okay. For whatever reason, the video she sent me, yes, good grief. Okay. <clears throat> The video she sent me yesterday, it just hit me really powerfully. I was very teary in watching it, and it was, <laughs> it was a kid. How old was this boy, probably? Eight, seven? <laughs> Throwing the most unholy fit. And in her line of work, she deals with very difficult children, and it's all day, every day. And um, she 
the, the video, I mean, he, he did, you, you know, and you're not allowed to do much in school anymore. You just sort of have to <laughs> contain and they had kind of blocked him off and letting him, I, I don't know. It was a very short video, but it, it was powerful to me. And it just brought tears and I just sent back, you know, that I was, that I had just stopped right then and I had prayed for her. I had prayed for him and that I was in tears. <laughs> and, um, I, you know, that's just, I mean, we just see Kim come to church and, you know, don't know some of that stuff that's going on. And I realize it's her job, but it goes way beyond that in those circumstances. Um, I want to tell you a quick little story about Lisa Watkins. She's just going to kill me. Um, <laughs> I don't know how long ago <laughs> I don't know how long ago that she met Bart. It's been there's a man named Bart who lives up here in, in Einhelig's um, old place, and a single man. And, and uh, Lisa got to know him through some upholstery or something. I don't even know. And um, you know, over the years, they just have kept in contact. And then uh, where we kind of got involved, he got very ill, had shingles, really bad, and. And he's an older man, and he just was really struggling. And so uh, she was going to go on vacation for a couple of weeks. So she asked us to, to take meals to him um, every day for the time she was gone. So we did that. So some of us kind of got to know him a little bit, you know. But she, she does this on a regular basis. She takes him meals a lot. He is much better now, and he is able to. But she still, she watches out for him. She keeps in contact, you know, all of those kind of things. And she's telling me a story this week about, um, well, his, uh, well, a few weeks ago, his well house exploded, <laughs> just like literally exploded a fire, the whole thing. And he was very lucky it didn't do anything to his house. So she worked with getting all of that fixed, getting him on city water and all of that, which was a lot of work, a lot of her time. She's a busy woman, but it's, you know, she, she helped him get all that done. Um, and then his dog died. This could be a country music song here in a minute, but <laughs> his, uh, his dog, that Jack, that he was very close. He loved this dog a lot, and it, it died. And actually, Aaron and Clint went over and buried the dog for him and everything. And anyway, so, of course, he, he was wanting another dog. Well, Lisa was somewhere... Um, uh, hanging curtains, I think, and she got a phone call, and Jody jokingly said, is that your boyfriend? And so this woman kind of looks at her, and she goes, I think I need to hear a story. <laughs> and so they told this lady about Bart and just the involvement and, and everything. And this lady tells her, she said, um, where I work at the at women's clinic, we've been looking for a project, and we would like to take this on and help him adopt a dog, get him the dog, you know, everything. And um, so they did that. And the other night, um, they brought a dog, and they, they uh, two or three of them came and, and everything, and, and they brought a boy. He's probably, what, 10, 8, 10? And uh, he really just really got along with Bart. He likes to read. Bart likes to read and all this. And I don't know, this, it, it just kind of made an impression on me. I thought, you know, all these little things that you do, you know, how they, how they can have an impact on other lives. Because I'm looking now, okay, well, maybe this, this lady, they would like to keep in touch with him. They would like to be involved in his life. So where does that lead, you know, with this boy? I don't know if he has grandparents in his life or anything else, you know, but this could be one added grandparent in his life that could, you know, be good. And just those kind of things, I thought, and, of course, it was so funny this morning. I have to just tell this. <laughs> I get a text from Lisa this morning. I already know I'm going to do this. <laughs> I get a text from Lisa and it says, um, I may be late. I have to go over to Bart's. His dog is missing. Because <laughs> like, she was going to, you know, help lead song service. And I was like, uh, oh, no, you know, I hope everything's all right. So then I get another text. And it said, the dog came back. It brought a dead cat as a gift for him. <laughs> I said, and, and proud of the gift that he brought him. And I said, well, I hope the neighbors are as proud of the gift as the dog is. <laughs> she said, there's quite a few stray cats around there. So we'll hope it was a stray and not the neighbors. But, um, I, I, you know, it's just that uh, the last one that I'm going to mention to you is, um, uh, and I just realized I forgot two things, but that's okay, um, is uh, I was going to mention Shirley. 
and she'll just shake her head. And DeRay, and it's funny because I started thinking about DeRay. Where'd she go? There she is. And uh, I, you know, I was just kind of writing down some things, and it was so funny because I'm going, um, I don't know if I'm talking about Shirley or DeRay. It's just that it's a few years apart. You know, the involvement in home and school. I mean, they're both nurses. They both have three boys, which is enough for us to acknowledge and <laughs> give them some credit for that. But, um, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, their their complete involvement in home and school and in their church um, Sabbath schools all these years, and you know, all of those kind of things. And I thought, and then there's so many others. Um, I actually have a gift for DeRay. I've been meaning to give it to her for a long time, but I'm going to give it to her today. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing about um, boys and laundry. <laughs> She's had a couple of posts on Facebook lately that I've talked about her boys and laundry, and it's about how much she'll miss those piles of laundry when they're gone. And, um, you know, I know there's a lot of... Every woman here could be mentioned for something. There, I, I was kind of making a list, and I thought, you know... I I'm probably shouldn't do this because you're missing so many. There's so many other teachers, you know, that touch lives every day. Retired teachers. Um, there's so many nurses. You touch lives at work and in your, you know, at church or whatever. But, um, you know, I just I want you to think as you watch this little short video um, about the invisible woman um, that um, you know you are loved and hopefully, you know you all of us, the men in the church, but the women to each other, that we are acknowledging, you know, the value that we, that we are. We don't feel valuable. I can tell you that, you know, anybody raising little ones, it, your day goes by and, and, and it ends and you didn't see much value in it. <laughs> you might not, because some days are just getting through without killing them. And, you know, I know that, um, uh, you know, so I, I just would like us to, you know, affirm somebody today. Make that your mission today. Um, and then let's watch The Invisible Woman. I would say, turn the TV down, please and nothing would happen. So I would get louder. Turn the TV down, please. Finally, I would have to go over and turn the TV down myself. And then I started to notice it elsewhere. My husband and I had been at a party for about three hours and I was ready to go. I looked over and he was talking to a friend from work and I walked over and he kept right on talking. He didn't even turn toward me. That's when I started to put it together. <laughs> he can't see me. <laughs> I'm invisible. I'm invisible. Then I started to notice it more and more. I would walk my son to school and his teacher would say, Jake, who's that with you? And my son would say, nobody. <laughs> Granted, he's just five, but nobody? One night a group of us gathered and we were celebrating the return of a friend from England. Janice had just taken this fabulous trip and she was going on and on about the hotel she stayed in. And I was sitting there looking around at the other women at the table. I'd put my makeup on in the car on the way there. I had on an old dress because it was the only thing clean and I had my unwashed hair pulled up in a banana clip and I was feeling pretty darn pathetic. And then Janice turned to me and she said, I brought you this. <laughs> it was a book on the great cathedrals of Europe. I didn't understand. And then I read her inscription. She wrote, with admiration for the greatness of what you are building when no one sees. You can't name the names of the people who built the great cathedrals. Over and over again, looking at these mammoth works, you scan down to find the names and it says, Builder, unknown, unknown, unknown. They completed things not knowing that anyone would notice. There's a story 
about one of the builders who was carving a tiny bird inside a beam that would be covered over by a roof. And someone came up to him and said, why are you spending so much time on something no one will ever see? And it's reported that the builder replied, because God sees. They trusted that God saw everything. They gave their whole lives for a work, a mammoth work, they would never see finished. They showed up day after day. Some of these cathedrals took over a hundred years to build. That was more than one working man's lifetime. Day after day. And they made personal sacrifices for no credit. Showing up at a job they would never see finished for a building their name would never be on. One writer even goes so far as to say no great cathedrals will ever be built again because so few people are willing to sacrifice to that degree. I closed the book and it was as if I heard God say, I see you. You are not invisible to me. No sacrifice is too small for me to notice. I see every cupcake baked, every sequin sewn on, and I smile over every one. I see every tear of disappointment when things don't go the way you want them to go. But remember, you are building a great cathedral. It will not be finished in your lifetime, and sadly, you will never get to live there. But if you build it well, I will. At times, my invisibility has felt like an affliction to me. But it is not a disease that is erasing my life. It is the cure for the disease of self-centeredness. It is the antidote to my own pride. It's okay that they don't see. It's okay that they don't know. I don't want my son to tell the friend he's bringing home from college you're not going to believe what my mom does. She gets up at four in the morning and she bakes pies and hand bakes a turkey and she presses all the linens. Even if I do all those things. The women who serve here, we thank you so much for each one. We ask you today to please heal Carol, be with Rochelle and her unborn child. And we ask you to please be with each of those women in the prison and with Janet as she goes in there today. Now, I ask you to please listen for just a moment to the unspoken requests as we take a moment of silence. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing us today. Please give us faith, help our unbelief. I know that you hear us, I know that you can do anything, and that you promised, if we ask in Jesus' name, according to your will, that you will do what we ask. So we ask these things in your name, according to your will. But above all, we ask that you please take us all to heaven together with you in the end. And thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. I realized something really important. When I was up here before, I was supposed to introduce Miss Carolyn, <laughs> and I forgot. I would like to introduce you to Carolyn Crawford. Um, she is, has become a very dear friend. It's funny how honestly little I know her and how good a friend <laughs> I feel she is. And I have watched her in so many circumstances 
be that way to so many people. If she has met you, she knows you and already loves you, <laughs> and she remembers you. That's the incredible thing. And um, I just enjoyed, and I did not get a bio on her. I should have. And maybe she'll tell us a little bit. I don't know if she wants to do that. But she is a very educated, very smart woman who um, has done a lot of incredible things. And we just appreciate so much her being here. And she is going to bless us with a special music and then um, speak to us. Good morning, church family. received blessings this morning. We had no idea that we would be needing each other and the Lord had everything in her bag is what I'm told. <laughs> I'm not at all interested in you remembering me as uh, one who has a PhD or anything else. I want to be remembered as a child of God and your sister. So when I come to Cowboy Camp Meeting, I just look forward to it. It's just such a wonderful gathering. You know, it's great to come together as we are here today to receive the blessings and just share with one another. And at the beginning of every day to seek a sense of direction before we start our work or activities. And always remembering to refresh God's promises. Let me share what the spirit of prophecy indicates. We know not the results of a day, an hour, or a moment 
may determine. And never should we begin the day without committing our ways to our Heavenly Father. For after all, when we are unconsciously in danger of exerting a wrong influence, the angels will be by our side, prompting us to a better course, choosing our words. Now, I need to ask you, do we need help in choosing our words? You know, our Sabbath school lesson indicated that our words reveal what's really in our heart. Hmm? You know, I just had a person to say to me, I I'm surprised that you're just driving a Nissan. Um, I thought you would have been in a... Uh, did she choose her words? A young man told me this week, he says, you know, I have a new girlfriend. And someone came up to me and said, are you having sex? I, oh, why would that come out of somebody's mouth? You know, we need to choose our words wisely. You know, Jesus did not suppress one word of truth, but he uttered it always in love. He exercised the greatest amount of tact. And I think that's what's missing. We don't have tact. We need to be thoughtful. We should have kind attention. And in his interaction with people, he was always kind. He was never rude. Is there anyone uh, present today that has not been rude? Raise your hand. <laughs> Jesus never needless spoke a severe word, never gave needless pain to a sensitive soul. He did not censor human weakness. So why do we? He spoke the truth always in love. Also, the angels will be influencing us, if we will allow it, our actions. Thus, our influence may be silent, unconscious, but mighty power in drawing others to Christ and the heavenly world. I have a question for you. Would you agree that we do not have the wisdom to plan our own lives? I want to stop and reflect on the fact that the women met at some person's, a member's home last night, and I thought that was really wonderful just to get together and not really have to be worried about business or the laundry or whatever is going on. I think most of you are aware of that. But I want to share with you that our world church, our world church, is leading out in the recognition of women's awareness. Why do we stop and recognize women? Well, perhaps because the 2005 world population data indicate that women make up 60% of the world population, then it should not surprise you, after learning of that makeup of the world's population, that women make up the majority of Seventh-day Adventist membership worldwide. <laughs> In addition, it shouldn't surprise you that I viewed the directory for general conference and 55% of their employees are women. But perhaps we should stop here. And I want to view these numbers with heavenly eyesight and wisdom. What do these numbers reflect as it relates to how we are enhancing our gifts and our talents that God has given to you and me. How are these numbers relating to our salvation as well as those we come in contact with every day? Then may I ask you if we could just get practical this morning. What does God expect from these numbers? What 
does God expect from his children, women, men? He does not merely give us a set of expectations. He actually shows us how to live, how to obtain the expectation. If you would, turn with me to 1 Timothy, the first chapter in the 16th verse. I'll give you a moment to get there. And I will be quoting from the King James Version and Living Bible People's Translation. How be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth long suffering for a pattern for what? And you can all talk at once. For what? For a pattern. To them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. What does God expect of me and you? We know that as Christian men and women, God wants us to use our gifts and our talents in service. But what we don't know, or perhaps we really don't acknowledge is, that God should be the center of our lives before we use our gifts and talents. Amen? Amen. And if he's not, guess what? Nothing else matters, Teresa. Nothing else matters. I wonder, Stephen, where have we gone wrong? Jesus was a teacher. Such an educator as the world never saw or heard of. He spoke as one having authority. Turn to Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. And I think we could all quote this for memory. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The only begotten Son of the infinite God has by his words, his practical examples, left us a plain pattern. A plain what? A plain pattern which we are to copy with God's hand on us. By his words, he has educated us to obey God. And by his practice, he has showed us how we can obey. This is the very work he wants every man and woman to do. Yes, but to obey intelligently. Mm. Intelligently. God desires us to exercise our reasoning power and the study of the Bible will strengthen and elevate the mind as no other study can. Yes, by precept and example, teach others what they must do in order to be obedient children of God. Don't force feed them. Don't peel back their skull and try to pour information in. Did you hear that? I was at a practice last night. We were getting ready to do a, a Christmas concert at the Mormon church this evening at 7 o'clock. One of the tenors is sick. If you can hear my voice, I think mine may be coming on from being around them. And he couldn't sing. So he had to go to the doctor, and he got a prescription. That prescription was good for what the doctor prescribed. But could he take the whole prescription at one time? Would it be good? So it is with the word of God. Don't overdose people. Give it to them at the right time. Give them what they need at that moment. Let's learn to be good listeners and then share with people. Not only did Christ give explicit rules for showing how 
we may become obedient children, sons and daughters, but he showed us in his own life and his character just how to do those things which are right and pleasing and acceptable with God. So there's really actually no excuse why we should not do those things which are pleasing in his sight. The great teacher came to our dark world to stand at the head of humanity. And I believe that darkness has almost reached its limits. Just listening at the news every day and observing what is going on. Yes, he came to remove the dark shadow by revealing to the world the infinite love of God that Jesus came to live among men and women. You see, showing that he would elevate and sanctify humanity by his holy obedience to all of God's requirements. Did you hear that word, all? All of his requirements, not those that are convenient for us. Showing that it is possible to obey all of the of the commandments. He has demonstrated that a lifelong obedience is possible. Thus, he has chosen representatives. And who might that be? You and I. Yes, you and I. We are to be representatives to the world as the Father gave his Son. We are not our own to act as we choose, but you know, it's just my personality. Why I, you know, sometimes come across in a very harsh way. Sorry. Time out. We are not our own to act as we choose. We are called to be representatives of Christ. We are bought with a price as the chosen sons and daughters of God. We should be obedient acting in accordance with the pr principles of his characters as revealed through his son to exemplify in our life the life of Jesus Christ. In him was found the perfect ideal. To reveal this ideal as the only true standard for attainment. To show what every human being might become through the indwelling of humanity by divinity, that all who receive him would become. You see, it is God's purpose to manifest through you and I the principles of his kingdom. And sometimes I think we get the principles mixed up with our preferences. Sorry. We are to reveal his principles, not our likes and our dislikes, that in the life and character they may reveal what God would have them to know. He desires to separate you and me from the customs, habits, and practices of the world. Oops. Huh? By beholding the goodness the mercy, the justice, and the love of God revealed in his church. That the world is to have a representation of his character. For this, Christ came to this world. He came to show men and women how to be trained, how on earth they are to practice the principles and live the life of heaven. It said they were to be trained, not forced. They are not to be treated like we're in the armed services where we all have to do this at this time and this is the way you have to do this. We are to give each person the opportunity to grow as Christ has given each one of us to grow. So what does God expect of you and me? Turn quickly to Mark 12, 30 and 31.
And I know that most of us know this one. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all the soul and with all the mind and with all the strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Do you believe that? Well, do you think... Do you think we know how to love? If we actually knew how to love, we could disagree with one another and not put the church in just shambles. We need to learn to disagree in love. You see, God desires that we should love him first. See, don't try to love me until you love him because we can't do it in and of ourselves. Do you believe that? That we put him first in our lives. That's what he desires. That we make him the center in the joy of our life. Some may falsely believe this morning that, that you have already arrived. Mm, think again. And if God is not first in your life, it's not too late to make him first. Then he will provide clear directions. He has that GPS for what he wants to accomplish. What God expects of you and me. Let's be serious about that. Just think. If we lose heaven, we lose everything. If we gain heaven, we gain everything. Let's not leave this assembly this morning without lifting our eyes to the Savior and saying, let's lift Jesus as the center of our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Our closing song will be 54, Great is, our, great is Thy Faithfulness.
church would like to invite y'all to stay for potluck. We have some amazing men at this church as well as women. But they have shopped and they have prepared for the food for today. There's plenty of food, so we invite all of you to stay and enjoy to see what the men have provided for us. Shirley's going to give our uh, prayer today. Let's bow our heads. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you for your faithfulness to us, and we thank you for this church uh, and for all the many people who have put it together to make it a strong church, and we ask that you'll that you will bless us, bless our meal today. We thank you for the men who have cooked it, and we ask that you'll bless our food and our fellowship today. In our precious name, amen. <coughs>